Our dear Lord, we call on your name tonight and um, we thank you that we can come to you tonight and come together and learning. We pray that you would um, prepare our hearts and that we would receive what you have for us to learn, to, to gain revelation and understanding of what you would like us to know in your word. God, we pray that you would uh, lead Dane and um, trust that you have been giving him the, the information, Lord, and anointing his study time, that it would be a blessing to all of us here and those who might hear later. So we just thank you for this time and um, give this over to you and pray for all those that are with us and those that have not been able to join us tonight. We pray blessing them wherever they are at. In your name, Lord Jesus, amen. 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 Thank you. Right. So tonight is, uh, we're finishing halfway through tribulation period uh, in Revelation. So that's from chapter four all the way to chapter 19. Uh, we're going to hit the midpoint tonight in that tribulation period. It's also halfway through the book itself. Out of 22 chapters, we're finishing chapter 11. Uh, so this is, this is our halfway night. And tonight we get what some commentators have called the key to understanding the whole book. Uh, I haven't quite found it to be that pertinent that it could be the key to the whole book. But I think it is probably one of the more important chapters uh, in, in all of the Revelation because uh, this introduces to us uh, what is probably the catalyst for the, uh, for the revival that will happen in the first half of the tribulation period. And that would be uh, these two witnesses uh, we, we read about in the first half of the chapter. So let's do a quick review of what we looked at uh, last week. Remember that John had eaten a small book that the angel had uh, presented him. And his lips, are, on his lips it was sweet as honey, but in his stomach it was very bitter. And we, we tried to figure out what was that bitterness, why, why did it hurt, though it was sweet. And we... Uh, landed on the fact that judgment is finally coming for all the wrongs that have ever been done on this earth and that those judgments are uh, about to be completed and Jesus Christ is about to take the throne. So that is a sweet revelation, but there is still pain left for uh, John, for the people of faith and also specifically for Israel and Jerusalem. Uh, so uh, these first two verses helped us to understand a bit of that bitterness, but we're going to take a look a little uh, deeper now at what that bitterness really was. So we have verses one and two. Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court, which is outside the temple, and do not measure it. For it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for twenty or for forty-two months. So this time of the Gentiles is a period uh, that spans all the way from uh, the southern kingdom's captivity by Babylon back in five eighty-six, all the way up until the end of the tribulation period. This is all. Uh, under the biblical category of the time of the Gentiles, during which time God has allowed Gentile nations to uh, rule over the earth, where his intention is for uh, the capital of the world to be Jerusalem, his holy city, where he will rule from during the millennial kingdom. So during this period of time, Jerusalem has been uh, on a back burner, even though up until 70 AD, it was still in existence and still uh, a nation. It never had that, uh, that title deed, for lack of a better word here, of ruler of the earth or the, the primary city on earth. Though in God's heart, it remains that central city on earth. 
So we see here in Luke 21, which is part of Luke's record of the Olivet Discourse, we hear Jesus' words, Woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, for there will be a great distress upon the land and wrath to this people. And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and they will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, this verse is often taken as uh, just a panorama view of the time of uh, the, or of the uh, dispersion of the Jews after 70 AD. But in context, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. He's been asked a question about uh, the end of times. And preceding these verses, he describes the tribulation period. And then he says, woe to those who are nursing and who have babies in those days. He's talking about the end times, this period of time at the end of history. So this uh, scattering of the people, this slaying by the edge of the sword, Jerusalem being trampled underfoot, this is looking all the way to the end of history here. Uh, so we're putting it in this last seven years. But as we'll go through and see some verses tonight, it's specifically the last three and a half years, because the Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel for seven years, but he's going to break that covenant halfway through. And that's uh, going to be one of the most pivotal points during that tribulation period. Uh, this trampling of the temple is done by one who's called the lawless one, who we have identified as the Antichrist, but we're going to take a bit closer look at who he is and what his activity is, uh, because it's at this point during the tribulation where his identity will become absolutely certain. Up until this point, there's an Antichrist system, an Antichrist government or politic. But this is where it narrows down on one single person who is the Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. So we read from 2 Thessalonians 2, 3 through 4. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the departure comes first. Oh, Holly, you're on speaker. Yeah. Okay, I'm just... uh, okay, let me read that again. Uh, let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the departure comes first, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. So this man of lawlessness is going to exalt himself as if he were God himself. This is the same sin which Satan, or which, uh, Satan committed uh, for his fall, saying that he would exalt himself above the seat of God. This is the same sin that Satan tempted uh, Eve with, saying that she could be like God. So this is not a new sin, but this is uh, essentially the climax of this sin, where it's going to take place in the very temple of God where the ruler of this earth will place himself there and actually be worshipped as God. Uh, this time will be particularly uh, difficult for the Jewish people. In fact, it, it's depicted much like a Holocaust, so that when the Jews were undergoing the Holocaust, many people thought these verses were being fulfilled. Uh, unfortunately, these verses have not yet been fulfilled in any way. Their fulfillment is all yet future. So there is a greater Holocaust still coming on the Jews than they've ever experienced before. So in Matthew 24, during Matthew's account of the Olivet Discourse, we read, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through the Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is in the housetop must not go down to get the things out that in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. So this period of time in which the Antichrist is revealed 
and puts himself in the temple, saying that he himself is God, and pulling all worship that should go to God to himself, uh, this is a sign for the Jewish people that uh, should warn them that this Holocaust is about to come uh, to their land. So they, at this point, have been warned to flee, and that will be about three and a half years into uh, this tribulation period, and it will begin what's called the time of Jacob's trouble or uh, the great tribulation. So a little earlier here in Matthew 24, we read, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days, but pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath, for then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. Unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be cut short. So the elect in this context, Jesus Christ speaking to a Jewish audience, this is speaking of the elect people of Israel. Uh, and it's looking forward in the context to this final three and a half years of the tribulation. And all of this takes place around the context of the covenant made with the Antichrist. And that was... Uh, warned about back in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, where Daniel wrote, and he will make a firm covenant with the many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he will put a stop to sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate, even until a complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who makes desolate. So this destruction that is going to come on Israel has already been decreed. It's been foreknown already by God. Uh, but also this one week uh, is kind of important. In my opinion, it's poorly translated. The Hebrew word for one week is the same as the word for Sabbath, the seventh day, and it's also the, just simply their number seven. Uh, so this is whoever makes a covenant the many for one seven. Uh, so it's one set of seven, and in the context of Daniel's 70 weeks or 70 sevens, uh, actually identified as years. And that's confusing for people because they think it's non-literal. But what it is, is it's simply a transliteration in the text rather than a translation. So week has been transliterated from Sabbath in the Hebrew when it should have been translated here as one seven. Uh, usually things like this stick because they're memorized, they're used frequently in, in books and in sermons so that one week or Daniel 70 weeks becomes something that's pretty well known to us. Uh, even, even if we don't uh, understand the Hebrew behind it, but it would be clearer here to say that it's one set of seven. So this is going to be seven years uh, that the covenant will be created with the Antichrist. But halfway through those seven years, he will go back on that covenant. He'll break the covenant and uh, he will bring destruction on Jerusalem. All right, so let's take a look at these prophets. We read in verses three and four. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Notice here the, uh, the means of numbering the time period has changed. Rather than 42 months, it's identified as 1260 days. The only reason for doing this would be probably be to distinguish them as two different periods of 42 months, where the first one, uh, which is the destruction of Jerusalem, is looking at the last half, the last three and a half years. This uh, 1260 days is probably looking at the first half of the tribulation period, uh, so that two different ways of numbering is used so that you know it's not the same period of time even the quantity of days is still the same. Uh, so during that first half of the tribulation, 
there will be two olive trees or two lampstands, and they stand before the Lord of the earth. They're identified here in the text as two witnesses that have been given authority from God. So during this time, during these uh, 42 months that will come after the 1260 days, the, uh, the worship of the beast will be really a distinguishing factor between those who are gods and those who are Satan's. And this is similar to what the, uh, the first century Christians were going through. Uh, with uh, Darius there, the Roman emperor at that time, where they were actually using as a test of whether someone was a Christian, the requirement to worship the emperor, uh, because only the Christians would not do that. So this would have been very clear to the first century uh, audience when they're undergoing a similar situation and they're being told of this situation, they will recognize it uh, or be able to in interpret what John is writing to them much easier because they're going through this at that moment. And it's in a sense, kind of an anti-type of what will happen in the last days. So again, remember when we're going through and interpreting uh, Bible passages, we wanna know who it was written to because we have to put ourselves in their minds. It was written for them to understand and for us to glean understanding from. So we have to know how would they have interpreted this? How would they have understood this? Um, and that's one way that we can uh, see for the first century, this would have had a lot more color to it, a lot more life uh, in these words because it was their present experience. Only here they're being told it will be far worse and it will be the antichrist, the beast, the man of lawlessness that will arise in the end days acting like Darius who will call all worship to himself. Uh, so in Revelation 13, 4 through 5, this is a passage that is specifically about uh, the Antichrist. Chapter 13 tells us the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, so here we read about the Antichrist. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? There was given to a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and a three to act for 42 months was given to him. So these 42 months, uh, again, correlates to the last half of the tribulation period. But now instead of authority being given to two witnesses from God, here's authority being given from a dragon to a beast. This is part of the unholy trinity where the dragon acting himself as if he were a god is giving authority to a beast acting as if he were a messiah. Uh, coming on the heels of the beast will be the false prophet who will be acting as if he were uh, the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we see here two different sets of authority on earth, one from Satan's line and another from God's line. And it, it brings about uh, our memories of Genesis, especially Genesis 3.15, where we've got the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the serpent will bite the heel of uh, the seed of the woman, and the seed of the woman will crush the head of the uh, seed of the serpent. And so we see, even in the very last days, this battle being uh, continued where the seed of the serpent has magnified itself to the point where it is standing in the temple calling itself God, and God has sent his two witnesses here to witness against him. Uh, let's see. This will be, this is called the abomination of desolation. Uh, that's both the theological term that we've adopted for it, but also uh, the scriptural term for that period of time when the Antichrist will, will take over the, uh, the temple of God in Jerusalem. So in Daniel 12, 10 through 13, we read, many will be purged, purified, and refined, but the wicked will act wickedly, 
and none of the wicked will understand, but those who have insight will understand. For the time that the regular sacrifice is abolished and the abomination of desolation is set up, there will be 1290 days. How blessed is he who keeps waiting and attains to the 1335 days. But as for you, go away to the end, then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. Now, this is probably one of the harder passages in all of Daniel to understand. And it probably remained pretty hard to understand until we were given the book of Revelation. Uh, first thing I would point out is the 1290 days and the 1335 days. Neither of those are 1260 days. In fact, we've got an extra month of 30 days on the first one and an extra 75 days or two and a half months on the second number. So we are going to look at those a bit on the next slide, uh, but also realize that in verse 13, the angel who gives this vision to Daniel has told him that this isn't going to have anything to do with him specifically. His duty is to reveal this. It says, enter rest and rise again for a lot of portion at the end of the age. Daniel is going to die before any of this takes place. And that's important because some try to say that these times where these dates started during Daniel's age. That's not true. Uh, Daniel died, and he expects to rise again at the end of the age. And only at that point will these have anything to do with him, because he will rise during these 1335 days, and we'll look at that uh, in a minute. But uh, right now in 2021, there is no temple in Jerusalem. But for this verse to come true, there must be a temple in Jerusalem. The temple was destroyed in 70 AD, uh, the temple of Herod, uh, which was the second temple built after uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the first temple, and it was built again under Cyrus' permission. Now we're waiting for another to come, who will be similar to Cyrus, but also similar to Nebuchadnezzar, who will allow the third temple to be built, but will then put an end to the temple uh, ministries at the halfway point of the tribulation. So this third temple is something to be anticipated yet because uh, these sacrifices, the regular sacrifices, must start again in order to be, uh, to be abolished at the halfway point. All right, so uh, here's a simple graphic so we can get in our minds kind of what's going on here. We've got two different periods of 1260 days. The tribulation is the first 1260, the great tribulation or the time of Jacob's trouble is the second 1260, which is usually talked about as 42 months. We've got then another 30 days that come after it and then 45 days that come after that 30 days. Uh, I personally think this is purposefully vague, not so that it can be confusing, but so that it grabs our attention, that it draws us in, and we, we get invested in actually trying to figure these things out. Uh, it's, it's kind of a hook that drags us into the Word of God. Uh, if things were laid out as plainly as we'd like them, we'd read it, we'd all agree, we wouldn't discuss it and internalize it as much as when we have to actually get in and figure some things out and wrestle with the text a bit. Uh, so here is my best understanding or best estimation of what these 30 days will entail uh, and what these 45 days will entail. And this does have uh, a lot to do with my theological understanding. This is a theological jump. It's not something that's detailed in the text. Uh, so it's not something we can be dogmatic about, but I, uh, I would be comfortable saying that this is my idea of what will happen during those 30 days and 45 days. So the three days uh, is probably God's direct judgment through Jesus Christ on the unbelievers who are left alive after the Great Tribulation. Uh, we'll look at some verses about that in a minute. The 45 days are probably Jesus' restoration of the earth, uh, resurrection of the Old Testament saints, and the tribulation martyrs. So first there will be 
a completed destruction where the 1260 days has ended. Uh, it's no longer God's uh, judgment on the Antichrist system, but it's Jesus Christ essentially taking care of the stragglers, those who have chosen not to accept him as their savior, but have not been killed by the Antichrist system, nor the plagues that have come on the earth during the Great Tribulation. Once that is complete, Jesus Christ will begin to restore the earth for the millennial kingdom, and that will take 45 days. During that time, uh, the resurrection of the, the dead, not in Christ, but in faith. Uh, not church saints, rather, but Old Testament and tribulation saints. Uh, and then following immediately that restoration, the, uh, the beam of seat judgments for the Old Testament and trip saints will be the 1,000-year kingdom of Christ, where he will rule perfectly over this earth while Satan is bound um, in the abyss. And this is not unprecedented either. Uh, there is usually some sort of a transition period between dispensations, and this tribulation is the capstone to the dispensation of grace. Uh, granted, we don't see this as exemplary of grace, but as we've gone through the tribulations so far, we've recognized that even in God's judgment, he offers salvation. This is his last period of offering grace before the dispensation of grace ends. And he's using these disasters on the earth to point people towards himself. So where for the last 2,000 years, we've been given a carrot. These last seven years, they get the stick. Uh, but still, grace is offered during that period of tribulation. Grace will not be offered um, during those 30 days of transition. Uh, after those 30 days, there will be none left alive. Who have not put their faith in Jesus Christ. But think back also to the last dispensational shift from law to grace, because the law ended at the cross, uh, but grace, the period of grace, the church did not begin until Pentecost, 50 days later. Um, so we had a 50-day period of time between the dispensation of law and the dispensation of grace. This is a 75-day gap. There's two uh, things that need to be done during this period, and uh, they'll be done very well and perfectly because Jesus Christ is the one doing them. So that should uh, take care or clear the clear the air about what these disparities in numbers are. Um, and again, they should draw our attention. They should be round table conversations, I guess, of, of uh, theological minds trying to figure out what does this mean. Uh, we don't want to be dogmatic, but we do want to have a good idea. All right. Uh, so during this last uh, period of tribulation, the three and a half years, the Antichrist will turn his wrath toward Israel, toward Jerusalem, toward the Jewish people. But God will act to protect them during that time. So in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, we read, The woman, who is Israel, fled into the wilderness where she had place prepared by God, so that there she would be nourished for 1,260 days. So that, again, is that uh, period of time, three and a half years. Uh, the period of the cessation of the offerings in Jerusalem is always a period of mourning, even though this third temple will be the temple of the Antichrist, uh, not one established to worship the Christ, uh, because only those who have not accepted Jesus Christ uh, as their personal savior are looking to build a temple again. It's the Orthodox Jews, not the Messianic Jews, who want a temple, because for the Messianic Jews, Jesus Christ is their temple through whom they worship God. Remember, uh, when Jesus met the, the woman at the well, she asked him, do we worship God here or do we worship God at the temple? And he says, there's coming a time when you'll worship neither at that place nor at the temple, uh, but uh, worship in spirit. So the Messianic Jews have their temple already in Jesus Christ. Uh, it's those Jews who are unbelieving uh, that are looking for 
a rebuilt temple, uh, but God will still mourn uh, the ceasing of these offerings because the temple is a holy place to God. And that's why we see at the beginning of this chapter, God measuring out the temple and giving the outer court to the Gentiles, but he still considers that inner court uh, a sanctified place uh, because that is uh, his location to dwell among men that he has ordained for himself. Uh, so we read in Joel 1, uh, verses 8 through 9, Wail like a bird girded with sackcloth for the bridegroom of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn the ministers of the Lord. Now, I didn't include any of these verses uh, in these slides, mostly because of a lack of space, but there will be uh, sacrifices offered in a temple during the Millennial Kingdom. There will not be a temple or sacrifices after the Millennial Kingdom. So these sacrifices, again, are not going to be burnt offerings uh, where death is going to be necessary for them to be um, offered because Jesus Christ has already fulfilled that offering completely. But we see the grain offering and the drink offering are still going to continue in the millennial temple because those are offerings of worship, not offerings of uh, uh, the covering of sin. Because those remaining uh, in the millennial kingdom will have, uh, except for the few mortals who are out in the kingdom, he is the church entering into the kingdom and the Old Testament saints being resurrected into the kingdom uh, will have glorified bodies, will have perfected uh, minds, perfected hearts. And it's just like uh, in the New Testament, we read that when we see him, we will be like him. Uh, my favorite verse, Philippians 1, 6, that he who began a good work in us will continue until the day of the Lord, uh, that our progressive sanctification ends at that period that we are translated into our eternal uh, and perfected bodies, or not perfect, but uh, glorified bodies, where it's a different body altogether. Uh, okay, and these two... Uh, or the, the imagery here of a lampstand and two olive trees is consistent with the antitype of this uh, period of history, which was the first rebuilding of the temple uh, back in the time of Cyrus. Uh, so Zechariah prophesied about this, and it was uh, the high priests Zerubbabel and Joshua who were instructed to rebuild this temple and to preach or to uh, prophesy against the nations who were trying to keep them from rebuilding uh, this second temple uh, back in the few centuries before Christ. So we read in Zechariah 4, then the angel who was speaking with me returned and roused me as a man who was awakened from his sleep. He said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see, and he behold, and behold, a lampstand, all of gold, with its bowl on the top of it, and its seven lamps on it, with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps, which are on top of it. So it's essentially describing a menorah here. Also, two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. This is interpreted later on in the vision, uh, and it's interpreted as... Then I said to him, what are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I, ans and I answered the second time and said to him, what are the two olive branches which are beside the two gold pipes which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me saying, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. Then he said, these are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. Uh, this uh, has immediate fulfillment, the anti-type uh, fulfillment back in the time of Zechariah when Zerubbabel and Joshua uh, rebuilt the temple or oversaw the rebuilding of the temple. But it has its completion, its fulfillment uh, with these two uh, preachers or witnesses during the tribulation. 
So we read about the antitype and that helps us to understand better uh, what the final fulfillment of this prophecy will look like. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These are the eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. Uh, so these images of sevens also that appear here, we saw when we were looking at chapter five, the seven eyes of the lamb. Uh, these are the seven eyes of the Lord, which range to and fro throughout the earth. We identify these as the Holy Spirit, um, just like the seven lamps burning before the throne of God. Uh, the seven... Uh, the seven founts in the menorah uh, where the oil is held we also would identify as the holy spirit and just as uh, well the menorah itself is not the holy spirit but the oil within it uh, is the holy spirit which gives the power or the function um, of these men to go about the work of god that without the holy spirit coming upon them they would be capable of standing in that day. Um, so just as it was there with Zerubbabel, having the power of the spirit coming upon them, so it will be again uh, with these two witnesses who will have the Holy Spirit come upon them. Because remember, just like before the church, so after the church, during the tribulation period, the function of the Holy Spirit is going to be different. Uh, it will still convict men of judgment it will convict men of the truth of jesus christ but at that time of faith it doesn't come into them and have a ministering work in their hearts as christians that for us in the church is is the ministry of the helper a particular uh ministry of grace that god has given us through this evil age uh that we can live and serve him uh, but during this period of the tribulation, that will not be the case because the Holy Spirit is bound together with the church. And when uh, the church departs from the earth, uh, it will be because the Holy Spirit has departed. And so the church goes with them. Uh, we are intimately united with the Holy Spirit, um, never even throughout all of future history to have that separated from us. <clears throat> Uh, so back in the time of Zerubbabel and Joshua, this was the decree from King Cyrus. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Now, Cyrus is a pretty interesting guy, and most of us know of him only as the one name that was prophesied beforehand. Uh, by Isaiah, before even the captivity began, that Cyrus would be the one to uh, come to the rescue of the Jewish people in Babylon. Uh, and it was specifically because Cyrus' name was specifically uh, written in uh, the text of Isaiah, which Daniel had and was able to show Cyrus uh, that Daniel fell into favor with Cyrus and he believed that he was uh, he was called upon by God to do this certain task. I kind of think of it like, uh, was it Harry Truman, who, who was seemingly prepared uh, from his youth by his mother saying, if you ever have an opportunity to help the Jewish people um, do that because the Lord loves them. One day he finds himself president during the Holocaust um, and has the opportunity to uh, be the very first one to recognize the statehood of Israel uh, against their enemies who surrounded them. So uh, a similar thing happened with Richard Nixon, Nixon in, uh, during the Six-Day War. But that's what happened here with Cyrus, uh, that he was not only given the kingdoms of the earth through this time of the Gentiles, the title deed to earth being passed down through Gentile kings. Uh, he was the second one who took over Babylon, rule over the earth, passed on to him as the Medo-Persians. 
Uh, this time of the Gentiles, remember, began with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, and it wasn't completely a negative thing, although it was a judgment on Jerusalem, on Israel, and their uh, God's desire that they rule the earth. Well, God passed it on to the Gentiles so that the Gentiles actually do have the right to rule over the world uh, during that period of time. Daniel says, uh, actually Nebuchadnezzar says, you, O king, are the king of kings to whom, no, this is Daniel speaking, sorry. You, O king, are the king of kings to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, the strength, and the glory. And wherever the sons of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the sky, he has given them into your hand and has caused you to rule over them all. You are the head of gold. So God actually put Nebuchadnezzar in this position to be the ruler of the world um, at that time. But God predicted as well through uh, Daniel, there would be successive kingdoms of Gentiles that would come after this. And these are global politics, not, uh, not just local, but they have rule over the entire earth. So that was handed down from Nebuchadnezzar uh, from the Babylonians to the Medo-Persians with Cyrus and then to Greece, and finally to Rome. Now, Rome didn't get conquered by anyone, but it simply petered out and turned into what the European system is today. Uh, so that European system will probably rise up in the last days and complete the Roman, uh, that Roman uh, time of the Gentiles where the Romans rule over the earth. Uh, because Europe, in a very uh, real way, does still rule the earth, uh, but the Antichrist will probably rise out of a European uh, governmental system that takes power over the entire earth. Uh,